Dr. Jacqueline Mathis. She received her uh, bachelor's degree from Harvard University in environmental science and public policy before going on to her PhD at the University of California, Berkeley, uh, where she received her PhD in environmental science policy and management. Her research is uh, focused towards feed feedbacks between the ecosystem processes, climatic change, and land use change. And her presentation tonight, forecasting the ecosystem impacts of invasive insects in the northeastern forests, is relevant to us who spend time, uh, especially like out in the field, and seeing these changes happening real time. And so, whatever we can learn about where things are going, it's very welcome. So, warm round of applause for Dr. Jacqueline Mathis. Thank you. It's a real pleasure to be here and to opportunity to share um, some of my research with you all. I remember sitting in these very seats for some geology classes that I took. I, I was sort of the environmental science and public policy. Let me combine the fun classes from ecology with the earth science classes. And so uh, that, was a, that was a big motivation uh, in my major to think about this, those two perspectives. Um, so it's a pleasure to be back. And um, yep, like Matt said, um, so thank you for the invitation too. And Matt, um, as Matt said, I'm going to be talking about um, forecasting today and using models uh, with data sets, of course, to try to understand um, near-term changes to forest communities. And so most of the work I'm going to talk about today is from a modeling perspective. I also do field work, though, too, and that's something that I really appreciate is how much we need these field observations of how things are changing in order to be able to have this connection between being able to predict the future but also understand the present and the past. And so um, that's sort of the connection and thread that I'm going to talk about today. Okay, so when we think about um, forests, insects, and pathogens, we know that there are lots of different types of disturbances happening within forests. But if we think about herbivory, it is the most widespread and sometimes the most important disturbance um, to primary productivity in forests. Um, even more important than climate change in a lot of places. Of course, they're connected sometimes with insect dynamics, uh, but herbivory plays a really big role in impacting trees. And um, from a really broad global perspective, this is important because if we think about um, one of the things that forests are doing is storing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere in their biomass. And um, terrestrial ecosystems and oceans have taken up about 40 to 50% of the emitted um, carbon dioxide that we've released as fossil fuels. And so ecosystems have been doing a huge service for us so far in helping to buffer um, the effects of climate change and um, helping to take up some of this carbon dioxide that we're releasing to the atmosphere. However, one of the things that um, terrestrial ecologists worry about a lot is um, how these processes might change in the future, especially if we think about um, this uncertainty of climate change um, disturbance feedbacks in the future, things like forest fires, uh, insect outbreaks, and drought that make this future um, ability of terrestrial ecosystems to take up carbon um, more uncertain. And so when we think about um, insects and pathogens, they play a major role in creating these disturbances um, in the carbon cycle and in forests. And so um, insect and pathogen introductions have increased tremendously with global trade networks. Um, some scientists have called this the new Pangea, this new um, physical connection of the continents that have been separated in evolutionary time. Um, so insects and pathogens are introduced to new ports as um, goods are moved um, from, from port to port. And um, the most common uh, pathway for introduction of insects and pathogens is through shipping pallets. So they, it's really hard um, to, to make sure that shipping pallets are completely free of insects and pathogens when um, they're constructed in order to ship goods. And then um, as those pallets reach a new port, the pallets are sort of taken apart and sit there, and insects and pathogens can um, get, a, get a foothold within a new ecosystem, where oftentimes the plants in that new ecosystem don't have the, de the defenses that build up over evolutionary time in order to fight off um, those insects and pathogens, those herbivores. <coughs> and so if we think about um, within the northeastern U.S., as many of you probably know, the northeast U.S. is a hot spot of diversity of these introduced pests. Uh, we can see it's, I don't know if that's something to be proud of, uh, but we have a, a, a high diversity of, um, of, of plants and also a high diversity of um, introduced forest pests within, um, within this area um, compared with the rest of the United States. 
And I think part of that is because of the, the large role of global trade within the Northeast and the amount of goods that are shipped within this area, and also the diversity of our forests and our ecosystems where these things can sort of get a foothold um, once they're introduced. And so when we think about forest insects and pathogens, I call these FIPS for short. Um, when we think about these FIPS, um, forest insects and pathogens, they can create um, sort of severe consequences for, for ecosystem services. So if we think about a forest system, um, before an, an insect or pathogen is introduced, um, it has a high level of ecosystem services. Um, after the introduction of a pest or disease, most of those ecosystem services might decline. And then in the recovery, the end state of the ecosystem oftentimes doesn't look the same as it was before. And so they create um, shifts in ecosystems where some species recover, while other species might be um, permanently removed from that particular ecosystem. And this is where, um, if we think about how management sort of might fit into um, this perspective as well, this highlights opportunities for management and interventions too. If we think about prevention of the introduction of these insects and, and pests, um, or adaptation policies to help um, the recovery of these ecosystems from these disturbances. So these are sort of areas of opportunity for thinking about what to do um, in reaction to, to these FIPS. Think about FIPS, they have these large ecological consequences. They also have really high economic costs. Um, so in the US, wooden flow and boring insects cause $1.7 billion a year in costs to local governments who have to deal with tree removal um, and uh, the sort of help to deal with the, all the dead trees that are left over um, from insects and pathogens. And they also cause um, really high losses to residential property values, as too. As you see um, in this uh, sad example of this street in Worcester, um, before and after the emerald ash borer uh, moved, through, moved through that street. So really um, big ecological consequences and large economic costs as well. So we think about um, insects and pathogens and their effects on trees. Um, the effects are complex at the individual tree level because trees rarely die for one reason. It's oftentimes this complex set of synergistic stress from lots of things together. And so um, this is what uh, sort of true physiologists have dismally called the death spiral um, of stress, where a lot of these trees are, might be experiencing um, effects of insects and pathogens, like a bark beetle outbreak or some exotic pathogen, root rot. And then um, it sort of sets the tree on this, on this spiral of declining health where they start to become more susceptible to other diseases or things like heat stress or drought stress um, in response to that sort of weakened state. And so when we think about um, insects and pathogens sort of in, in the, the earth system, um, I'm an ecosystem ecologist, so I sort of work a lot in scaling impacts from, from local scales to global scales and back again. Um, insects and pathogens we know are really important sources of disturbance, but they're not represented in most ecosystem models are models that predict um, sort of what's going to happen with the carbon cycle. They're left out. Because they're so hard um, to sort of pin down, there are thousands of different species. It would be hard to put every single species of different type of insect and pathogen into a model. Um, and so, uh, so far in the, in the um, sort of for the scientific community, they've been left out. But we do know that they're really important and also can interact with climate change and other stressors within ecosystems. And so I would argue that understanding FIPS impacts on ecosystems is really critical to be, being able to predict future changes um, within forests. And in particular, um, what I'm gonna talk about today for, focuses on the role of forecasting um, FIPS impacts, which can provide uh, important foresight um, to changes that, are, that might happen and also help to think through opportunities for adaptive management. So we're talking about forecasting, we're thinking about a near-term um, forecast, and we might be able to um, understand that forecast and sort of step in if we, if we think that the system is moving in some direction where we want to try to um, react and, and um, fix it. So what is a forecast? How is this different from any other, any other model? We talk about a forecast, uh, we're talking about a prediction, but a prediction about the near-term future. A lot of ecosystem models are, are run out to decades and centuries to, to predict long-term change. Um, I'm really interested in the near-term future. Uh, forecasts also leverages both uh, the power of both models and data together 
Um, so as I'll show you in a couple of examples, the data and models are working together to, to leverage the power and information that are in both approaches. Um, it also represents the confidence in prediction, um, and it can be iter iteratively updated with new data collection and model refinement. So as new data come online, you can feed it into the model and get a better prediction um, through time. And this is, we, we encounter this um, all the time in our daily lives when we think about a weather forecast. And so this is what a weather forecast is doing. It's making a prediction about the near-term future. It's, it's fusing together models with data. As new data become available, they make a better forecast. It comes with uncertainty. So if it says an 80% chance of rain, um, you sort of know what to do and you know how to react and adapt um, to that particular forecast. And so um, the, the goal of um, this work that I work with in collaboration with a lot of other, um, call ourselves ecological forecasters these days, um, is to try to develop this predictive capacity for ecosystems in the near-term future where we might react and change um, in response to that forecast. Okay, so um, if we think about why is a forecast useful, um, ultimately this is a question that a lot of people care about. What will happen in the short-term future that impacts my decisions? If we think about, um, I don't want to get into the climate change uh, debates and things like that, but we think about the number of people who believe in weather forecasts versus the number of people who believe in climate change, which is like a really long-term <laughs> process. Um, people will believe a weather forecast because it's about the short-term future that's going to impact them directly. And so the same thing um, is important for ecosystems. I'm not saying I know the long-term is important too, but the short-term I think is important for adaptive management. Um, and also um, we can, <coughs> We can test hypotheses with ecosystem models where we can make a prediction and then we can go out and measure stuff and see if we were right. Um, so that is really important because it helps us to tell um, how good are our models of how things work. Okay, so if we think about um, a forecast, this is like a really complicated diagram. Uh, this stuff on the, the left side of this diagram is showing this iterative forecast cycle. So you use models to make a forecast you collect more data, these are observations, and you refine, your, you refine your prediction. And then you go through this feedback loop over and over as you're making uh, better forecasts, collecting more data, using that data um, to make a better prediction. And this is where, like I was saying, there's this, this real opportunity to use these forecasts to think about um, adaptive management of ecosystems too and how, how we might react to these predictions. And so um, if we think about our, our overall goal in um, using these forecasts, um, as I mentioned, we can't forget the long term. Our overall goal is to sort of see how we're moving along some trajectory within the ecosystem. Um, and so if we think about the ecosystems are responding to chronic stressors, this might be disease progression with time or warming with climate change, uh, but some chronic stressor but then they also experience these episodic disturbances. And so if um, ecosystems uh, experience these episodic disturbances, this can lead to things like species reordering, um, some shift in the composition of a forest where some trees are starting to become more abundant, or it can also facilitate um, the immigration of new species to that forest as well. And so I'll talk about um, an example of where we're sort of tracking that um, at the end of my talk. And so understanding these processes is important to understanding how these systems are shifting. Okay, so um, a brief overview of sort of the conceptual model. When I say a model, I'm talking about um, these sort of pools of carbon within the ecosystem and then how they're moving um, between the atmosphere and into plants, so through productivity into plants. Um, and then there's being stored within trees trees are respiring some of that carbon back to the atmosphere, they're transpiring water up their stems, and then insects and pathogens disrupt these flows within trees. And so um, with, with one of my collaborators, Mike Dietz, we came up with a framework where we said it's impossible to represent every insect and pathogen in an ecosystem model. So we tried to take a functional approach and think about these categories that they fit into um, based on how they connect, how they disrupt plants. And so if we think broadly, there are classes of phloem feeders, um, things that sit near the leaves of trees and suck out this fresh photosynthate um, that, that trees fix before it can be used by the rest of the plant. There are roots rots and stem rots that reduce um, the structural integrity of plants or, help, or um, disrupt their ability to take up nutrients. 
There are xylem disruptors, things like bark beetles that burrow through and cut off the xylem flow of trees. And there are defoliators um, that consume leaves. And so we use this functional framework to think about the impacts of insects and pathogens broadly um, within ecosystems. And so in this, um, with this modeling framework, the model that I use um, simulates the tree species competitive demography. So it's representing uh, different species of trees within a forest and then how they interact with each other, how they compete for light, how they compete for nutrients, um, and, and the, the resulting um, simulation that we get predicts forest structure and then carbon, water, and nutrient um, storage and exchange um, with, with the surroundings. And so um, in this modeling framework, we're trying to also connect together uh, these two questions, where are FIPS in the forest? So for this, we can use um, things like remotely sensed imagery, survey data, and spread models. Uh, with this other question, how do FIPS impact the forest? And so uh, this is that, that modeling framework that I just showed where we're trying to represent these as functional groups within an ecosystem model and how they're impacting um, different species of plants. Okay, so I'm going to um, go through two, sort of two case studies of how we're using this approach um, to understand the impacts of invasive forest, forest insects. Um, we're working on a project where we're forecasting the near-term impacts of the 2015-2018 gypsy moth outbreak across southern New England. And then we're also um, using this framework to try to predict um, what's going to happen with the impending arrival of emerald ash borer and hemlock woolly adelgid at the Hubbard Brook Experimental Forest in New Hampshire. Okay, so first I'll talk about um, the gypsy moth, uh, Lamentria dispar. Um, this is an insect that was introduced to the U.S. in 1869. Um, it's a defoliating insect that prefers oaks, but during uh, really large population eruptions, it'll eat almost anything. Um, and the population um, eruptions of, of these caterpillars have been challenging to predict. And so um, this time series here shows uh, these really large outbreaks. Can you probably remember this huge outbreak in 81 um, that defoliated a lot of um, the Northeast. But since um, a fungus was introduced in the late 1980s, population levels have remained really low. In fact, some entomologists even said, um, gypsy moth isn't a problem anymore, it's gone. It's controlled by this fungus. But anyone who is uh, in some areas of New England uh, in the past couple of, couple of years know that that's not true. We had a surprise severe eruption and defoliation through southern New England in 2015 to 2018. Here's an aerial uh, photograph taken in June in Rhode Island where you can see there were some areas that were just really severely um, defoliated. Every leaf on these trees was consumed um, by, by the caterpillars when they emerged um, during this outbreak. Um, so this, these maps on the left are showing um, from, a, from a satellite picture what the defoliation looked like in 2016 and then 2017. And so you can see in 2016, the defoliation was really most severe in uh, these parts of Rhode Island. And then 2017, the, the um, defoliation became widespread. Um, so the uh, populations really spread out um, from this initial um, severe outbreak in 2016. And so um, when we're thinking about how do we model the impacts of gypsy moth um, from this perspective, within a single year, um, leaves flush, the caterpillars emerge, uh, the caterpillars eat all the leaves, but it's not over yet for the trees. Um, trees have a lot of uh, resources where they can, once the caterpillars um, pupate, the trees can draw on that stored carbon that they have um, stored up in their biomass and flush a second set of leaves. Um, and so usually trees that are defoliated just once recover and do fine um, in the next year because of this, these nutrient stores, these resources that they built up. However, if there are several years of repeated defoliation, trees are having to produce two sets of leaves every year this, is, this becomes really expensive from sort of a nutrient uh, perspective. And so our hypothesis in this work is that with repeated defoliation, this is going to deplete the amount of stored carbon within trees and um, diminish the resilience of these forests, diminish the ability of the, of the trees to recover from this repeated outbreak. And so um, in this work, we're using, we're using the modeling framework to think about um, these three questions. First of all, how did defoliation impact uh, the productivity of these forests, the carbon balance? Um, secondly, did defoliation frequency reduce the resistance of forests to disturbance? So with repeated defoliation, was there more and more mortality? 
And then we also looked at how resistance varied by forest composition. So whether the stand composition of the forest um, influenced the ability of it to um, recover from these outbreaks. Okay, um, so to, in order to do this work, um, we ran model simulations across southern New England um, during the, we started the model in 2012, so a couple of years before the defoliation um, outbreak happened, and then a couple years um, passed, so to 2022, so forecasting a few years in the future. And um, to connect together these two questions, where are the insects and pathogens with the ecosystem model, we used um, satellite imagery. Um, I'm sure as many of you know, the, the gypsy moth uh, creates these really spatially patchy um, areas of defoliation on the landscape, so it can be really hard from just sort of long-term monitoring plots to catch them. Um, and so satellite imagery is a really great tool to be able to see um, where leaves are, are missing when it should be um, peak growing season. And so we use um, a satellite defoliation data product to look at the amount and location of defoliation across the region. And so um, this sort of just shows you uh, conceptually how the, how the satellite um, data product works. It's, the, it's from the Landsat satellite, uh, which has been Versions of it have been in orbit since 1972. It's one of the oldest um, Earth observing satellites. And so we use um, long term Landsat time series to generate what we think the ecosystem should look like at that time of year. So that's the red line here. What we expect um, to sort of be the case for uh, the ecosystem at these different times of year. And then the dots are showing um, the image that actually exists for that, for that time. And so we can see in these years, it's, it looks like it matches pretty well. It's green, it's green, it's green. But then in 2016, the observations were way lower than we would have expected um, sort of for a normal growing season. And so from that, we can sort of quantify how bad the defoliation was in these different spots um, across the landscape with the satellite imagery. And so we bring that into the model, uh, that we bring that, those data into the model and we um, implement a reduction in the leaf area that corresponds to how far um, the greenness decreased within that, within that pixel um, in response to defoliation. Okay, and so if we look at this first question, um, how did defoliation impact the, the carbon balance? We um, compared, to, in order to say like how, how bad was it, um, we compared to baseline conditions, so we ran model scenarios with no defoliation, so as if the caterpillars had never emerged. And so we compared um, the reality to what would have happened if there were no caterpillars within the forest. And so um, the, this first plot is showing a time series, so years on the x-axis here, and then the proportion of baseline productivity is on the y-axis. So this is the amount of productivity in a defoliated year divided by the productivity in the baseline scenario. So it's like showing what is the fraction of productivity in a defoliated year compared to baseline. So it's using those baseline conditions as sort of um, the typical what would have happened if the, if the insects had never emerged and then using the defoliation scenario to compare against that. And you'll see um, within our sites across this region um, they varied in the number of sequential years that they experienced defoliation. So there were some sites that were only defoliated once, um, a few sites that were defoliated only two years, and then several sites that were defoliated for three years in a row. So in um, 26, 2015, 2016, and 2017. And that's sort of highlighted in gray here, the, the caterpillar impact years. And so what do we see? This is each line is a different site where we've run these model simulations and again, uh, this blue line here is showing sites that were defoliated only one year. And so we can see that sites that were defoliated only one or two years were mostly headed towards recovery by 2022, which was the end of our sort of near-term time period that we were looking at. However, sites that were defoliated three years in a row had a much longer trajectory of recovery and in fact, there were several sites that experienced such severe mortality that they're still really about 25% of the productivity um, compared to baseline conditions. Um, so particularly in areas of Connecticut and Rhode Island where these uh, forests have been hit three years in a row, um, they are experiencing a lot of mortality now, both in the model and on the ground. Um, so we have ground plots too where we're monitoring this. 
So um, when we're trying to understand this um, from sort of a, how the ecosystem is reacting to this new disturbance, one metric that we look at is um, resistance. And so we talk about resistance as the absolute size of the decline of some ecosystem process like productivity in response to disturbance. So it's like how far did the system get pushed after that um, disturbance happened within the ecosystem? How far did uh, productivity decline in response to that disturbance? And so um, when we looked at, at resistance, um, this was really well predicted by the number of years of defoliation, as you could sort of see, see by that huge spaghetti plot of all of those different trajectories. Sites that were defoliated only one year had a relatively small decline in productivity, whereas sites that were de um, defoliated two and three or one, two and three years had a much um, more severe impact from, from that disturbance. So we also wanted to look at how this metric of resistance uh, might vary with stand composition of the forests. And so one thing we looked at um, was oak basal area. Um, as I mentioned, um, gypsy moths prefer to eat oak leaves, um, although in defoliation years they'll eat almost everything. And we saw these really interesting patterns where uh, forest stands that had high oak basal area, so high oak abundance and large trees, so a really mature oak stand, were more resistant for one or two years of defoliation. But then in year, with three uh, sequential years of defoliation, the pattern flipped where those really large trees started to die from this repeated defoliation over and over again. And so this um, does kind of highlight what we think might be threshold effects within, um, within these trees and within these ecosystems um, between, in this, this flip between one and two years of defoliation versus three sequential years of defoliation. Okay, so some um, next steps of what we're working on uh, for the Gypsy Mouth Project. Um, this, this work is, is still very much still ongoing. Um, we're working on incorporating plot survey data uh, from areas around the Quabbin. You can see this is an aerial image of the Quabbin in um, 2017, and there are large patches of defoliated trees um, throughout, throughout the Quabbin um, forest area. And so um, for this, we, we had a, a, um, an NSF research experience for undergraduates team at Harvard Forest that collected a lot of data um, this past summer. And now we're working to bring these new data um, in with the model to um, generate better predictions and also to test the model and see how we're doing um, in these different areas. And um, I also have a senior honors thesis student, Emma Conrad Rini, who's working on um, thinking about the role that nitrogen might play in helping these trees to recover from, from this disturbance because trees have to spend carbon to make leaves, but then leaves are also really expensive for the tree from a, from a nutrient perspective too. And so she's trying to look at the role of different um, soil nutrients in um, predicting the ability of these trees to recover from, from this disturbance. Okay, so um, I'm going to switch, switch gears a little bit to talking about um, processes at Hubbard Brook Experimental Forest. Um, Hubbard Brook is in the White Mountains of New Hampshire, uh, this sort of dot right here. And Hubbard Brook is a long-term ecological research site. Um, it's maybe the, the site that defined the ecosystem ecology. Uh, many of you probably heard about, uh, or had speakers from who've worked at Hubbard Brook um, before. There's been, there's been really long-term research at this site um, and really long-term legacy of data um, at this site. Um, so in, in the, the, the White Mountains of New Hampshire, it's also funded by the, the National Science Foundation Long-Term Ecological Research um, site, and I have um, a work with students at this site. I am funded in part by the, the LTE network, LTER network at this site um, to do work. So we do a lot of field work up at Hubbard Brook. And so at Hubbard Brook, uh, there are two impending insects uh, that are sort of at the edge of the forest right now. They haven't been observed in the forest yet, um, but they're very, very close. Um, and that those are the hemlock willy adelgid and the emerald ash borer. And um, we're quite sure that they're likely to um, eliminate most of the ash within the forest um, and the hemlock within about the next 10 to 20 years. And so we're really interested in thinking about how will the forest change in response to these um, new invasive insects. And so these two insects, are also sort of interesting from a biological perspective because they, they, cause, um, they cause mortality within trees on different time scales. So the hemlock willy adelgid 
um, operates rather slowly as far as uh, herbivorous insects go, uh, where it causes mortality in about 5 to 15 years, whereas the emerald ash borer is really fast. Um, it typically causes mortality in 1 to 3 years. And so uh, if we think about sort of how these connect into this conceptual model, part of that is because of, um, because of how they, uh, sort of which functional group they, they fall into. And so the hemlock woolly adelgid is a phloem feeder. It's um, sitting at the base of needles and sucking out that fresh photosynthate, so sort of this slow stress um, on trees. Um, and then uh, the emerald ash borer is an example of a xylem disruptor where it's growing through the bark of trees, or the trunks of trees, and um, disrupting um, the flow through xylem. And so they have different um, impact pathways as well, if we're thinking about this from, from that functional framework. And so at Harvard Brook, as I mentioned, there is this legacy of long-term data back to about 1965, where many different uh, types of disturbances have been observed within, um, within Hubbard Brook forests. And the earliest of those around the 1960s and 1970s were um, the effects of acid rain within the forest. And so the effects of acid rain within the forest are sort of embedded within the, the forest data um, during this time period. And then bark, uh, beach bark disease um, was confirmed within the forest um, by the late 1970s. Um, You've probably heard about the sugar maple decline in this area, sort of in response to this acid rain legacy um, at Hubbard Brook, where the, a lot of the calcium has leached out of the soils now, um, and sugar maple are struggling. Um, and then also things like ice storms um, and wind storms within the forest as well. And so um, we're interested in thinking about what will happen um, in the future with this introduced um, hemlock willy adelgid and emerald ash borer on top of this long legacy of disturbance. And so this also connects to this, this sort of conceptual long-term change diagram that I, that I showed earlier, where we can think about some of these things are chronic stressors. For example, something like acid rain is sort of this continual um, stress within a forest. And then some of these, um, these, these disturbances are acting as um, episodic disturbances on top of that chronic stress. And so we're interested in trying to understand how the ecosystems will respond into the to the combination of those two things. Um, and so if we think about the, the differences in these two pathways and the composition, um, the tree composition, um, of the, the species composition of the forest, the emerald ash borer we think is likely to be a transient episodic disturbance because ash is a relatively small component of um, the, the um, composition, the species composition within these areas, um, whereas we think that hemlock willy adelgid will lead to species reordering and the facilitation um, of immigration of new species um, to the forest. And so um, one of the things we do in this work is um, also connect to other long-term data. So at Harvard Forest, there have been um, <coughs> long-term data collected on hemlock willy adelgid at this site. Um, it has already been infested with emerald ash borer and hemlock willy, adel willy adelgid for a while. Um, where at Harvard Forest, they are measuring um, myriad ecosystem <laughs> impacts, almost everything you could possibly measure um, of, of this system in response to hemlock willy adelgid. And so something we're doing in this project is using this data um, at Harvard Forest to try to see how well we can predict what's going to happen at Hubbard Brook. So these forests aren't the same. There are species that are different between the two forests. They have very different um, topography, where we're trying to draw on this data at Harvard Forest um, in order to predict um, Hubbard Brook. And so our first step in this work, which is the, the work that I'm going to show today, is where we've um, done sort of naive simulations where we uh, didn't use the Harvard Forest data yet. Uh, that's sort of on the, on the horizon, the very next step. Um, but we're doing sort of a first step to see how, uh, what would we predict if we didn't have Harvard Forest data uh, to draw on for our predictions. And so we ran model simulations at Hubbard Brook, um, assuming the EAB, the Emerald Ash Borer, mm -hmm. um, arrived in 2020. And we can see when we look at, again, this fraction of baseline productivity, this large decline in productivity um, when the ash borer arrives, but then this relatively but very quick recovery of productivity within the system. And so uh, the productivity declined up to 60% of baseline, but recovered within five years. And this is mostly because of compensation from other nearby species. Ash is relatively um, diffuse throughout the, the landscape um, at, at Hubbard Brook. Uh, 
And so when an ash tree declines, other species and sort of saplings in the understory start to grow really quickly in response and sort of fill that gap um, at, at, a, at a relatively fast rate. Um, there are other, there are other uh, groups at Hubbard Brook who are looking at, um, we think that ash might play a really important functional role for other species at Hubbard Brook too, particularly for animals. Um, so there are people who are studying um, the impacts of, of ash decline on um, insects and birds in particular because they have really high nutrient leaves um, as well. And so that's sort of a, an impact that's not reflected in this decline in productivity, um, but they do certainly um, potentially have impacts on, on other um, aspects of biodiversity at this site as well. Okay, so we also ran uh, model simulations with the hemlock blade adelgid, and we see um, sort of in contrast to the simulations with emerald ash borer, this causes a really um, long-term persistent decline in productivity at the site. And um, this persists um, past 10 years due to the spatial aggregation of hemlock in the forest. Um, so hemlock, uh, unlike ash, is not diffuse throughout the, the forest landscape. It's really clustered around riparian areas. And um, in those areas, it creates um, these, these dense canopies with a dark understory. Um, if, if you've walked through ash forests, uh, or excuse me, hemlock forests, I'm going to skip ahead to my picture here, my saprotrophic uh, fungi. If you've walked through a hemlock, an old growth hemlock understory, you know it's dark, it's humid. Um, it creates these sort of um, special microclimate conditions um, where particular species grow. Um, and so because of that lack of an understory, there aren't these nearby trees to suddenly compensate this um, loss of productivity when, when a hemlock tree um, dies. And so this, this um, sort of highlights uh, sort of differences in the ways that insects, um, in the impacts that insects cause um, on ecosystem processes in different areas. And again, this depends um, on the sort of biology of the insect and the um, biology of the forests, and then how the forests are arranged across the landscape as well. And so um, again, if we're thinking about this, this sort of conceptual diagram of chronic stress with episodic disturbance, uh, this is where we're really likely to see um, some species reordering and we are also trying to uh, measure and understand whether this might cause species immigrations at Hubbard Brook as well. And so one of those species that we're tracking that is currently not present at Hubbard Brook, but we think might get a foothold in response to hemlock decline is um, red oak. And so red oak has, has not historically been part of um, the Hubbard Brook forest composition. Um, however, we're starting to see lots and lots of more um, red oak seedlings establishing especially in these um, lower elevation parts of the Harbor Brook Valley uh, that are also sort of close to the, the entrance road here. And so this is a map showing um, red oak seedling abundance where we have um, high abundance of red oak seedlings um, in this uh, low elevation part of the valley. Um, and this is also where most of the hemlock is clustered as well. Um, a lot of these seedlings are sort of popping up near uh, hemlock understories. And so um, we're trying to um, collect these seedling data to understand whether the, the stress on, on mature species might facilitate the establishment of, of new species within these forests. And then, um, as I also mentioned, we are continuing to work with, um, with collaborators at Harvard Forest in using their data to try to understand and, cons and better constrain these near-term impacts of um, insects and pathogens at, at Hubbard Brook. And, um, that, with, with that, we'll, we'll hopefully get at this really important question of, of knowing one site really, really well, so we know Harvard Forest really, really well, and those, those um, impacts really, really well. Can that help to predict um, this response of a novel site, even if it's a little bit different? And so um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kind of start, start to wrap up there. I wanted to um, highlight a couple of groups and initiatives that I'm involved with that I thought might be of interest uh, to the broader group. Um, one of those is the Ecological Forecasting Initiative. This is a group of um, scientists in academia and in government and in nonprofits who are working together to try to um, get at this question of forecasting ecological systems. Work across lots of different systems. There are people who are aquatic ecologists and people who are working on biodiversity. Um, so from a lot of different perspectives, um, but, but that group uh, exists <laughs> if you're interested. I also work in collaboration um, with this Forest Ecosystem Management Collective, 
um, that's run out of USDA, um, University of Vermont, uh, Harvard Forest, and then the state agencies. And then uh, we also have a working group um, run out of, of USGS um, that focus on using ecological forecasts for risk management. And then um, also if the, the insects and pathogens create major impacts to northeastern forests, the best thing we could do is not introduce more. Um, and so one of my collaborators, Gary Lovett, has been uh, really instrumental in creating um, a, a large initiative to try to, in particular, um, lobby, lobby government officials to try to um, create better standards around um, imports of, of these insects and pathogens to, to try to prevent them from being intru introduced in the first place. So if you're interested in that, um, you, can, you can look up um, this Tree Smart Trade is their, is their name. Um, and they have lots of materials that you can um, use if you're, if you're talking with um, other people about, about these impacts. So with that, um, I want to briefly acknowledge the funding sources that support this work, um, these two NSF programs and the and, um, Wellesley College, and then also recognize um, the, the many, many people who collect the data um, that I use within my modeling. As someone who also collects data, I know how much work that takes, and so um, I'm really appreciative <coughs> of, of their work and effort. And uh, with that, I'm happy to take questions. In particular, I would be really interested to hear um, what you all think if you have different uh, places that you that you go where you observe these insects um, creating impacts within forests, <coughs> and then if you notice particular things that are changing within those, within those forests. Um, I know you all are out there, you're on the ground um, looking at these things, and so if you have um, particular things you think are, are interesting or would be good to note, um, I'd be glad to hear about it. And so thank you very much for the opportunity. But I was thinking about it, and I, I, they could because they are, uh, they would be an herb of, or excuse me, a defoliator, like the caterpillars, except a defoliator of the smaller size classes within the forest. So I think if we did have data on, um, on deer browse, we would be able to include that as sort of the defoliator category for those um, smaller seedlings, because you're absolutely right, they are a major um, disturbance within, for regeneration within a lot of these forests. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, um, I've been sort of looking at forests in Sherburn, kind of uh -huh. Mass. Um, there was a, it's basically a 10 acre patch, a very old oak tree. It's like yeah. 40 inches deep, uh -huh. and 40 inches deep. There's a partial line. Yeah, yeah, we have noticed Black Ridge coming in um, to sort of replace some of these other areas in um, Connecticut too, where um, the the um, yeah, there's just experienced large mortality within the canopy. And um, you're absolutely right too. 2016 was um, really really dry, and, and actually entomologists sort of credit that dryness with this, the outbreak of the um, caterpillars too, because if you remember back, they're controlled by this fungus. Um, and sort of that, that keeps the populations low, but during um, really bad drought years, the fungus uh, of the caterpillars can't, um, the, the spores become inviable because they can desiccate before they spread to another caterpillar. So in drought years, um, they think that we might see more reemergence of um, gypsy moth uh, because, of, because of that, the inability of that fungus to, to spread and control the populations. Uh, but it also, of course, uh, stresses the trees too. Recently, and uh -huh. um, the people I was with indicated that they had cut down a fair amount of trees on what they referred to as Hemlock Hill, and uh -huh, yep. um, we didn't make it that far up, but it looked similar to what Ted was explaining. It looked kind of black and purchish from yeah. where I my vantage, but it may be something just to ask somebody about. Or yeah, thank you. Yeah, that's a great idea. I, I'd heard that they, they cut a lot of the Hemlock um, from there, but yeah, I haven't 
followed up to see what's coming back. Yeah, there was a student who actually worked with um, us at Harvard Forest who grew up near that area. That was one of his motivations for studying Hemlock Willie at Delgin. That was sort of in response to this like childhood memory he had of walking around that forest, and now it's, they've had to cut down all of the trees. Um, I was noticing in the Landsat imagery, uh -huh. right during the really severe outbreak years, there's still these sort of little pockets mm -hmm. where there's much less defoliation. And I was wondering if um, if you sort of had any ideas about in those pockets? Is it sort of differences in topography that's sheltering um, trees or differences in composition or management or anything like that? We are trying to look into that. We haven't found any sort of like clear cut, this is exactly yeah. why not yet, um, but we're, we're especially trying to look into the topography now. We didn't find any um, big differences in things like um, stand composition between um, the areas that were and weren't um, defoliated. We have a lot of sites where the composition is relatively similar, but um, sort of areas that were that were spared. So, but topography is actually the one we're trying to okay. trying to look into now to see whether it was maybe, um, yeah, like site um, microsite conditions. Maybe they had higher humidity there, and the, the pathogen could I don't know spread and kill off the caterpillars or something like that. But yeah, it's um, not clear yet. <laughs> Hopefully, with more data analysis, it might be. looked into uh, interactions with other non-native moths like the winter moth and also I believe are native forest tent caterpillar right. outbreaks. Yeah, we and have. And then the second question is uh, have you used any um, any of the data from neon or neon towers? Or yes, yeah, so um, for your first question we haven't yet, although that was, uh, that, so I, I should say that that uh, is like on the horizon. We're trying to understand some of the some of the. I guess one of the things in looking and using the satellite imagery as a metric of defoliation is we don't know with a hundred percent certainty that that wasn't a winter moth or a forest head kept caterpillar defoliation, and we actually did start to pick up. Um, my colleague who does the um, sort of satellite imagery processing did pick up um, some 10, ca 10 caterpillar outbreaks um, up in, New in uh, Vermont and New Hampshire. Um, I think this was in 2017 maybe. Um, yeah, so we can, we can use that same approach to sort of pick up these, uh, these other insects as well. We haven't, we haven't done that yet um, to try to understand the impacts. And then as far as NEON data goes, um, yes, we are trying to um, use NEON data both at Harvard Forest, a lot of the, um, the they have NEON forest plots where they've um, established and are measuring um, trees within those forest plots that are in the Guavin. Um, so we're using, um, we have some of our own plots within the, the Guavin area, and then also leveraging the data from NEON that they've collected within the area too to um, monitor mortality um, and changes in Your, your basic metric then is primary productivity. Mm -hmm. Have you, is there a part in your model where you can say, well, red oaks are much more carbon sequestered than hemlocks? Yeah. Yeah, so that's sort of embedded within the model in the, um, they're, they're represented differently within the model based on their, um, their sort of how much carbon they take up through photosynthesis. And so, and, and sort of when they're when they're taking it up over the growing season, um, so they're that's sort of embedded within the the model framework because they're um, sort of calibrated for these different species. And so, um, because oaks have a have a higher photosynthetic capacity and are storing more carbon, that should be like uh, connected to the model. Yeah. Yeah, thanks for the, the talk. It was really nice. Um, yes. I have kind of maybe similar question about the productivity. So we have, I didn't include that um, for, for today's talk, but yeah, we have looked at um, how respiration, both of the trees and of the sort of soil community might change too, because when trees are 
defoliated, more light can reach the forest floor and it gets warmer too um, during the summer and temperature is a major control of microbial growth. So microbes are more active during the summer and chewing up all that carbon that's in the soil um, during the summer too in response to this defoliation. And um, they start to lose even a little more carbon uh, than, than the, the carbon that they've lost in productivity. Um, so we were surprised that the respiration effect wasn't, wasn't um, too large, but I should say that the, the respiration of trees that are stressed is data that we're really lacking. And so we have a lot of respiration data um, from healthy trees, uh, but we don't have a lot of data on how um, sort of the metabolic needs of trees when they're stressed. Um, and so there we work, um, I have some collaborators who are trying to use um, for that, they, uh, one approach is to use, uh, to measure the non-structural carbohydrates within trees and to try to understand how fast they're turning over and things like that, but um, it's tricky. So yeah, I would say for, for tree respiration, uh, that's hard. Yep. Um, in the next hundred years or so, we're looking uh -huh. at a shift of framework trees here in England. Yep. Um, how does that affect the lot? Yeah, I think, I mean, I think it's going to play a really big role. I think if I were if I were to caution guess, climate change is very, very important. I know that climate change is an important driver of ecosystem processes. I think insects and pathogens are going to be even more important than climate change in a lot of these areas and the management response to those insects and pathogens as well. Um, I have colleagues at Harvard Forest who study this um, and thinking about how people react to these insects and pathogens sort of coming um, into their forests and the response a lot of times is to cut down the trees because you want to be able to get some value out of the, out of the, the timber before it's infested with a, with some insect where you can't sell it anymore and so I think that the the introduction of these things uh, and especially um, the the just total decimation of some species like hemlock is is just creates this really important um, ecological role within forests um, also just like really <laughs> important compositional role and, and important um, for ecosystem services of streams um, and also just for aesthetics too. I mean, I love walking through the black forests. Um, and so I think, yeah, in short, I think it's going to be really important to um, influencing the, the long-term growth of these forests. And especially if, um, as, as other people were mentioning, we start to see earlier successional species moving in in response to this removal of these late successional species. Uh, it'll be interesting to see whether that really like resets the successional clock in some of these areas that have been um, old growth for a long time. Great. Well, thank you very much. That was Thanks. a fabulous talk. Thank you. So there's still. Um,